as Steve mentioned yesterday, I, I had also noticed a lot of papers about uncertainty sprouting up. And then judging kind of what, what I've been able to learn yesterday and today, I really appreciate it. It was a good idea to have, have this conference. I think we can bring, bring the analysis kind of to the next level maybe convert some of the uncertainty skeptics that are out there uh, by doing this a little bit better. So I appreciate that. What my, uh, my piece is about um, some of the mechanisms by which uncertainty might affect uh, the labor market. And I, I kind of put mechanisms into kind of two categories, a labor demand category, so to speak. Um, those types of mechanisms, um, uncertainty pushes down real wages. Um, one version of that theory, uh, one, one version of those mechanisms would be um, because of uncertainty, there's going to be less investment. And if you're the type of worker who makes investment goods, there's not really work for you to be done, well, work for you to do. I prepared a little back of the envelope calculation. We, we, there have been some more serious models kind of coming with the same conclusion, but let me show you kind of back of the envelope big picture why I think this investment mechanism is going to be kind of small on the scale of at least what's happened in the last couple of years in the actual labor market. So let's suppose we take all the entire drop in investment in 2008 and 2009, which amounts to about $2,000 per American. And let's say that all came from heightened uncertainty. And ask, well, what does that do to the labor market? They're going to, people want to spend $2,000 less per capita on, let's say, investment goods. Well, that's a 4% drop in the demand for labor. And that, unless you think the supply of labor is awful elastic, um, that's going to mean an even smaller decline in the quantity of labor, maybe about 1% using kind of moderate uh, labor supply and labor demand parameters. Whereas actually what happened to labor hours, it fell 10% and employment fell 7%. So this is kind of some of the back of the envelope reasoning. It tells me that maybe the investment channel for uncertainty, I, I don't, I'm not saying you should ignore it, but not sure how big it's going to be at, at the end of the day, on this kind of scale at least. But the second version um, of the labor demand channel, that uncertainty creates a kind of cost, maybe a perceived cost, maybe an actual cost of employment, over and above the compensation. Obviously, you've got to pay people to work, but over and above that, employers maybe perceive some costs, so they hire less. And that would be another kind of downward wage pressure uh, story. And then the third version, we saw a version of that today, that uncertainty was affecting uh, markup behavior. And all those have in common, they're kind of pushing real wages downward. Then on the labor supply side, there's kind of two stories I'll mention. One I'll mention briefly, it came up earlier, um, a precautionary savings motive. That might, depending on how that shakes up, if that shakes out in the direction of people wanting to work harder, uh, that would tend to push real wages lower. What I'm going to put my attention to today is another labor supply channel where uncertainty increases the demand for social insurance. And what that does is it um, reduces after-tax wages, but in the short term at, re at least raises somewhat pre-tax wages. And maybe I'll whet your appetite with just some, some data. You may have even seen this data before on, on wages. These data are detrended um, and put on an index scale. The black series are pre-tax wages um, from 2007 to the end of last year. And the red series is after-tax wages. I noticed the scale here, 100 obviously is included in the index, but it goes down to 87. Now I see some people look at that black series and they say, aha, I see downward pressure on wages. Uh, maybe, maybe you see that, but my point today is Whatever downward pressure that is, that is tiny compared to what happened to the Red Series. After tax wages fell 11%, 12%, something like that at, at its lowest. And even by the end, they were down 
Six, seven percent. Um, This is after taxes and benefits. Most of this is on the benefit side. We'll look at that a little bit of that later. The Black Series is labor compensation from the national accounts per man hour and woman hour worked. The red one is the black one adjusted for the fraction of your income that you give to the Treasury when you work. I'll show you a little bit of that at the end, but this is going to be macro until the last couple of minutes. Okay, so that the little model I, I used, try to think about another mechanism by which uncertainty could depress the labor market is a principal agent model. Definitely I didn't invent this model. I'm not even the 900th person to work with it. Um, Holmstrom and Milgram model, it's been used to study labor market issues by a lot of people, a couple here are Rosen and Guerin. In this model, or my version of it, uh, worker produces some output, and that's got three, that output kind of broken into three components. One would be his effort. Uh, second would be a random component, and that random component I'm going to consider public information. And then the third be a random component that I consider private information. A lot of times you don't see that middle component. It's not very fun. It's pretty simple. But I think it's maybe part of what's going on here, so I throw it back in there. That middle component's going to be fully insured because it's public, and that's what makes it kind of uninteresting to the economic theorist, but I think it's relevant. So we're going to keep it in there, so bear with me. Um, these are both idiosyncratic risks. In the model I'm going to work out today, you know, they average out in the nation, they average out to zero at all points in time. So when it comes to the public information risk, everyone's going to fully insure that. If they get uh, new bigger than zero, they're going to hand it over to the full insurance company. If they get it less than zero, they're going to receive something from the full insurance company. So what people will be left with after that full insurance transaction will be their effort plus the uh, private information, um, the private information shock. Now, when it comes to that shock, they're going to want some insurance, but not full insurance necessarily. So the degree of insurance, I'm going to parameterize for now uh, 1 minus mu. So a person's disposable income after all the insurance transactions, both types of insurance transactions, this is disposable income. It's going to be mu times his effort, mu times the private information shock. And then whatever receipts he gets from the treasury or the insurance companies, whoever's running the insurance scheme has some revenue and he has a share of that B. B, uh, in other words, in public finance, a B is described as a guaranteed minimum income. What happens if your own income is zero? Well, you, you're going to at least get B. I call uh, mu the self-reliance rate and one minus mu uh, marginal tax rate. The budget constraint for this social insurance the insurance I'm on the private uh, information shock is here. The guaranteed minimum in income has to add up to all the receipts. One minus mu is how much the treasury gets from your income. Uh, N is the total effort, the average effort in the economy. And then I've also put in a term here, fee, to allow, you can have fee equal zero if you want. Fee to allow for the possibility that there's more revenue than benefits, some administrative costs. I also think a fee is kind of a stigma cost, that your own money is somehow worth more than money that you're getting in insurance payments. So, which I also think is relevant of what's happened in the last few years. You can think of it for zero if you want. Uh, and as the average effort, um, and obviously in the economics, we'll have it on the next slide, the, the key public economics, of course, is People hold the average effort constant when they make their decisions, but of course the average is, and everybody gets the count in the average, and so what everybody does adds up to the, equals the average. So here's the individual's problem. Um, he knows 
what the tax rate is or the self-reliance rate is. That's a policy parameter he knows takes his given. Uh, he knows how much everyone else is going to work capital in. And he chooses his own effort level, recognizing that when he puts more for effort, he has a cost of exerting that effort. That's the last term. But he'll have more income, and he keeps some of that. That's the first term. So the effort's got to be optimal to the individuals. And then they got aggregate consistency condition that the average adds up to the, is equal to the individual's choices. So the way I set it up here, I, I use a little different functional form than Holmstrom and Milgram use. So I get a nice uh, easy solution for the equilibrium effort. Just depends on this disutility parameter gamma and on the degree of social insurance. The more you keep for yourself, the more you work. To the degree that there's any social insurance, the effort is uh, less than efficient. The efficient effort is just 1 over gamma to this eta power. Eta is also a utility parameter, and I, most of us would call that the uh, wage elasticity of effort supply. I'm going to define this, the exact form of this definition is not important. It allows me to draw some pictures. I'm going to define safety to be kind of the, the inverse of Uncertainty about your disposable income. SC is the standard deviation of a person's disposable income. It's going to be zero or larger. And I define safety as the inverse of that. Um, that standard deviation is an equilibrium result based on the degree of uh, social insurance and the other parameters and that, that I've worked out here. S epsilon is the standard deviation of that private information shock. It is just one period. Well, let's see what the results are, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Let's see what the results are. We should come back to the. How that would be different. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sort of the whole social insurance Yeah, I'm going to conclude that some social. I'm going to conclude one of my conclusions is that some social insurance is optimal. Maybe you disagree with that. I don't know. Another thing I'll show you is that we do have social insurance, in fact. That is a fact. Um, and I'm going to use some comparative statics um, on that optimal degree of social insurance when we get to it. So there's a safety efficiency trade off or an equity efficiency trade off. I'll graph here. I'm graphing it by efficiency, I mean the ratio of actual labor to the efficient amount of labor. So that's going to be between 0 and 1. You can have no actual labor or you could have fully efficient labor. You could even go beyond that, but I'll just look in the 0, 1 range. Safety has a range 2. You can have the maximum safety, which means we insure all these risks. Communism, if you will. Um, and this, different degrees of social insurance give you different points in between, and that's what I've graphed here. One extreme, so to speak, would be Marginal tax rate of zero, self-reliance rate of one. And the other extreme would be self-reliance rate of zero, marginal tax rate of 100%, and then spots in between. And societies have to balance this with politics or optimization or something. They have to choose somewhere in between. You can't be in two points at once. Um, choose some degree of social insurance and tolerate the reduced uh, labor efficiency that comes with it. If you want to think about the optimal degree of social insurance, one of it, one way is to set it up as I have like an optimal tax problem. First, work out the indirect utility function, as on the previous slide, where the individual is optimized. And then second, um, taking the individual's decision rules um, and then optimize the policy parameters against those. And that's what we have on this slide. That, on the top is the indirect utility function for the individuals. And 
um, mu would be the policy parameter that that's, uh, could be chosen to maximize the expected indirect utility. Comparative statics are no real surprise here. If people are more risk averse, they're going to want more social insurance. If there's less stigma, less kind of deadweight cost in this redistribution process, uh, they're going to want more social insurance. And if there's more variability of that um, private information shock, they're going to want more social insurance. I want to come back to what I mentioned earlier, that going back to the public information shock that gets fully insured. One experiment to think about is a change in the composition of information. He had the nu and the epsilon, and maybe their total variabilities hasn't changed, but information's kind of moved from one category to the other. That maybe the economy's more, for a while things are complicated, and I, I used to know, look at a guy who was not working, I'd be able to tell, well, his industry fell apart, or something happened, it wasn't his fault. Um, in other cases, I could say, no, that the guy's just lazy. Now things are more complicated. Everything bla everybody blames their situation on the economy, and it's harder to tell now what, um, what's the result of effort and what's the result of just bad luck. So that, would, that could be models just a change in the composition of information. But in terms of how it feeds into this problem, that would show that it's the variance of epsilon increasing. The variance of that other term would decrease, but that doesn't appear in the social insurance uh, calculus. Yeah. You, you just described how I can interpret an increase in the variance of epsilon as coming about because there's a bigger public source of noise. Then, uh, how does that relate to the public? Yeah, you had that explicitly in your model previously, but it wasn't interacting with the epsilon. Well, what I was thinking, maybe to go back to that, uh, this first one up here. There's some variability of output around effort. And it can go into, some of it go into either one of these buckets. I was considering an experiment, let's keep the variability of output around effort constant, but let's throw more of it in the epsilon bucket. And that on the next slide, they would say, okay, I, I'm willing to pay a higher marginal tax rate in that situation. You're holding fixed the amount of variability in individual output conditional on effort, but just switching the part that's private. Right. Private. So you're, you're, you're sort of increasing the insurable component, in a way. The, the what? Insurable. Insurable. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insured in, in a crude way, but it's, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, going back to my point about the, the savings and the, I mean, if you, if you think of this as a reduced form model in which uh, there is some self-insurance that you can do with savings, say by borrowing or uh, through collateralized, uh, uh, collateralizable assets or just uh, credit cards, right? And, and all of a sudden, these borrowing constraints get tightened, for example, because the you know, house prices fall and you have less collateral or because the, it's harder to borrow on credit cards. Then, you know, as a reduced form, you can think of this as, a, as an increase in the, in the variance of epsilon. But it's harder to insure, uh, to self-insure, basically. To, to, you know, it's harder to use private insurance to, uh, to, to, to insure income risk. And, I, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is that essentially I think I agree. The, well, my yeah. distinction is not so much between private and public. There are private sector transactions that look like tax rates. I mean, you you may be you may default on a debt, and they'll come to the university and say we're getting 10 percent of that professor's check, no, no, okay. and that would be just like a tax. I, who cares if it goes to the treasury to or to Citibank, right? Yeah. But that would be a risk carrying arrangement. But it's it's a moral hazard late in one, instead of a perfect information type of arrangement. That, that's the distinction I'm, I'm making. And it, some of the events you talked about might fit in that bucket. I, I agree. Okay. So if you look at an increase in the variance of epsilon, these are version of that story in this kind of picture, amounts to kind of a twist before the recession, we were at some, we balanced this somehow. Let's call it optimal balance for the moment. We balance this somehow. We tolerate some inefficiency. We have some sharing, but not perfect sharing. And now the variance of epsilon goes up, and that twists 
the, uh, this frontier. And it's a twist because if we were already subjecting ourselves to 100% taxes, then who cares about the variance of epsilon? Because nobody eats their own epsilon anyway. But if we're in, in a spot where we're not sharing at all, then that means that each individual has less safety holding the marginal tax rate fixed. So one thing was possible, I mean, the laws of physics and economics didn't prevent Congress from keeping the laws constant after 2007. We could have done that, but then we'd be at a spot like this with the same amount of efficiency and less safety. And so my interpretation of part of what happened in the last five years is Congress bought back some of the lost safety and they paid for it with labor market inefficiency. And so maybe we're at a spot something like this where we're still maybe facing more idiosyncratic risk as individuals than we used to, but it's not as bad as it would have been if we would have kept the marginal tax rate constant. So that's my, my little model of how uncertainty can affect social, the demand for social insurance. Yeah? Their intention. I presume Congress's intention mainly was just to try and stimulate rather than try and reduce risk. I agree. I don't yeah. Anyway, well, why did their constituents tolerate it? I think there are some people thinking, you know what, that food stamp program that I never imagined myself being on, I can imagine it now and I'll go along with blowing the thing up. Um, that's the type of thing I'm thinking about. Now, so that's just a little theory that says, well, maybe the degree of social insurance should have increased when the recession came on. This is data on the marginal tax rate. And to, to be a little more precise about some of the previous questions that came up, this includes benefits. In fact, almost all the action is on benefits. In fact, there's a little bit on taxes here, but it actually goes in the other direction. When the payroll tax cut brings this thing down. Um, almost all the actions on benefits. This is what I show you here. I'm going to give you a little treat a little later. But what I show you here is for the average person with a middle median skill, median ability to earn, not necessarily actually exercising the ability with median ability to earn. And the average, because some people are married and not married, there are many other variables, so they're kind of average in all dimensions except for ability to earn, in which case they're in the median. Um, so this is kind of a middle class situation. Uh, and by marginal tax rate, I mean you take a quarter and ask if that guy were to work that quarter or not work that quarter, he would generate some compensation from his work. What fraction of that compensation goes to the treasury? Either the federal treasury, state treasury, or local treasury. And that's what this number is. And it used to be, as a consequence of working, the guy, was, typical guy would get 60 cents for himself, 40 cents for the treasury. That went up to from 40 to about 48, and it's come down somewhat now. It's around 45. So the next thing I, I look at from my model would be how much uncertainty would we need or how much extra Richter version would we need to make it optimal to move the marginal tax rate eight points. Actually, what's more important is not so much how much you move the marginal tax rate, but how much you move what you keep. You used to keep 60 and now you're keeping uh, 52. How much of a change do you need to do that? Um, we'll come back to this in a second. So here I used uh, a quantitative, uh, a special case of my, of my model. It's Holmson and Milgram's special case of their model um, that you can do some easy comparative statics. Um, their special case, they have normal distributions for the shocks. They have uh, no stigma costs, unit labor elasticity, constant absolute risk aversion. Um, and if you did comparative statics with respect to the variance, uh, the standard deviation of the epsilon and with respect to the risk aversion coefficient, um, here's the comparative statics. We, we already told you the direction. Now we have magnitudes. I just told you what the self-reliance rate was. It was six, somewhere between 60 and 52. Um, so here we can, and I also showed you how much the self-reliance changed in logs. It changed minus 0.15. That's the log of, 
um, 52 divided by 60. And we, we could ask the question, or I should ask you guys the question, because you measure these things. Did the standard deviation of the shocks that people experience increase enough to reduce that by 0.15? Well, I just did a little division for you. If you put 0.17 here and 0 here, that would be enough. Or if you put 0 here and 0.34 here, that would be enough. The second term, I, the finance guys hog all the time varying risk aversion. I don't like that. I want the labor economist to get some of it. So I just don't know how much risk aversion varies, but the finance guys say that it does. So risk aversion would be another reason why people would want more social insurance. Um, Luke gave me just about an hour ago, he, he gave me some of his data on the option volatility at the firm level and aggregate level, and I tried to back out a change in the idiosyncratic component of the volatility, and I got 0.1. It's kind of the permanent part. There was a, some spikes in there where it went up much more than 0.1. It was about 0.1. So this, uh, the years I compared was 2005 and 6 to 2010. 2009 had a huge spike, and I, so I didn't look at that one, but 2010. Um, one source of data on this. You, you want income data. I think the um, <coughs> governor, this fatty governor has this, governor and Serder and Song have this paper looking at the Social Security Administration data and looking at the dispersion of that, both in levels and in changes. And that shows that actually that has a big left skew in the recession for the variance because of that. The spread goes up a lot, but I don't know the numbers. Problem is that it's got behavior layered on it. I mean, the options data do too, of course, we discussed yesterday as well. The options data do too. I mean, we discussed that yesterday as well. Um, in the idea, you should look at uh, wages, right? Individual wages. That's what you want to look at. But there's not, the full data you could do marginal parallel times efficiency yeah. units. There is no behavior there. Some stuff, right, if you look at TFP from firms and you see them measure it properly, that has no behavior. That goes up a lot. Yeah, that's a good idea. But all I can tell you today, is that to an order of magnitude, it wasn't that crazy to increase the degree of social insurance as much. In fact, there's a prior literature that's kind of used this kind of model to predict how much social insurance we have. And in fact, the model's kind of too powerful. The political economists have been saying for years that countries with lots of inequality should have lots of social insurance, and they've been disappointed not to see the result. So in a way, it's kind of too powerful. But it's easy to get out of this type of model a uh, uh, quantitatively significant increase in the degree of social insurance. OK, now going back a little bit, I'm going to show you some more data. I showed you how the marginal tax rates went up eight points. I'm going to show you a little bit more why. A piece of it is the thing you, I'm sure everybody here heard about how unemployment insurance was given out up to 99 weeks. You heard that over and over and over again. It's a piece of it. I, I counted in there. But there's a lot more that happened and you probably didn't hear of. Other rules for the unemployment insurance program changed. They paid people more. They paid for their health insurance. Um, those were pieces that add in here. The second biggest piece is the food stamp program has grown. Basically, the food stamp program has turned into an unemployment program for unmarried people. And, it goes, and it's indefinite. You can be on food stamps, not for 90, 990 weeks. Um, if you qualify. So there have been lots of uh, things that non-working people can get that they weren't, didn't used to be able to get. How many minutes do I got? 20 minutes. Um, so Casey, just to check, sorry, this is a very naive question, but you're measuring those things as increasing the tax rate because they get phased out as you work. So I'm thinking this experiment, you take a quarter off of work. Okay, it's not just phase out. If you're almost everybody, if they work for a quarter, no food stamps. The phase out's discrete. It's basically compared to it's not that you earn more less in work, it's that you get more out of work and therefore effectively the tax rate of being in work is high. Yeah, I'm comparing what do you what's your disposable income when you work a quarter versus not work that quarter? That yeah, just in my mind, I had, I just the word, I guess in my mind, I had the word tax, the same as you earn something and what they take away, and this is just a broader definition. It's a 
effectively what they take away includes unemployment benefits. Yeah, yeah it, sometimes it's called the implicit tax. So where, so where do you get the money that they the Public finance guys call it implicit tax. Yes. Just because the politicians never call it a tax, yes. but it okay. might as well be one, right? Yes. Thank you. Is that interpretation though? Like, yeah. I guess you're computing these things at some aggregate level, right? That just seems like, uh, let's say I'm a investment advisor, I'm out of work for a quarter, but then I go back to my job and I'm get, making $150,000 a year, and I mean, just like, the food stamp is a percentage of my income. I'll show you that, I'll show you that later, okay? I, I, I'm aware of that. Most people aren't investment advisors in America, by the way, but I will count them as much as they deserve to be counted. <laughs> Maybe some extra. Okay, the other now I'm going to go back to my back of the envelope calculation about how much uncertainty might work through the investment channel versus the social insurance channel or maybe some other channel. And the labor wedges can help with that. The I look at two labor wedges. One is what I call an, an employer wedge between productivity and I sh some down below you'll be able to see this, but I bet I mean labor productivity, output per hour. Um, and market wages. And this wedge has tax rate units. This is not a good example. Um, maybe a better example would be the new levy uh, that's coming, $2,000 per employee levy that's coming with Obamacare. That would create an employer wedge because it, it's a cost of employment over and above the employee compensation. So that's an employee wedge could appear there. Um, markups can create an employee, employer wedge. And we heard earlier in the conference how uncertainty might contribute to markups. And then the other side is the employee wedge, and that's between market wages and the household's marginal rate of substitution between consumption and leisure. I'm going to emphasize that also has tax rate units. So we can compare these. We can say, well, this is bigger than this or smaller, because they're in the same units. Um, a payroll tax on employees creates an employee wedge. A bunch of those other programs we talked about before create an employee uh, wedge. So formally, the employee wedge and the change in the log employee wedge is just the difference between change in log labor productivity and the change in log real wage. And the employee wedge is the difference between the change in log real wage and the log marginal rate of substitution. And I have data on real wages, try to put together data on the marginal rate of substitution, data on labor productivity, so I can show you estimates of these wedges. Turns out they're, neither of them are trivial, but the employee wedge is bigger. So here's the picture of these two wedges. The impor important part of my employee wedge is the marginal rate of substitution, which assumes a labor supply elasticity of one. Wage labor elasticity labor supply of one. If you assumed it was bigger than that, the black line would increase less. If you assumed it was smaller than that, the black line would increase more. Um, and this is the employer wedge. Employer wedge is kind of going in the right direction. It's not trivial. It's up three or four points. It's like adding uh, a payroll tax or something like that at 3 or 4%. That's not trivial by historical standards. It's not economically trivial. But it's a lot smaller. Number one, it's a lot smaller than the employee wedge. And also, it comes on a little bit later, a year or so uh, later. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not, but guess when they unfolded the first copy of Obamacare? It's right in here. Um, there's my marginal tax rate series. In theory, that the black and the red ought to be the same. If I got the right margin rate of substitution function and I measured everything correctly, they'd be right on top of each other. Um, they're kind of close. If you don't like using the utility function to get an idea of the employee wedge, well, then maybe you want to look at my marginal tax rate series. But either you want to do it that way, still I left with the conclusion that, number one, the employee wedge widened sooner, and number two, the employee wedge widened more. Um, and still more different than it was before the recession than the employer wedge was.
Now there's a point of view that's, that says, oh, so mar marginal tax rates increase eight points. Who cares? That doesn't, it, that used to matter in the old days, back in the 2000s or something, it used to matter, but it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, we have the zero lower bound and other, other kind of fancy things. Um, so I wanted to show you a few uh, results that might cause you to question that. I did in a, in a separate paper, it's not part of today's paper, but this is a special treat for everyone who came to tolerate the discussion today. Um, I, d I broke people, I broke the adult population into ten groups, five school groups based on their ability to earn, variables like schooling and age, um, and then two marital status groups, either married or unmarried. And then what I did is I looked at the program rules, the same ones that I used to make that aggregate marginal tax rate, I looked at them and made marginal tax rate series separately for each of the ten groups. And then I measured separately, this is an exercise of looking at laws that Congress passed. Separately I looked at data on hours worked for these different groups based on their schooling and age and marital status. Um, I got that from CPS data. So these are entirely different data sources. Same in the previous slide. When I show you the red and the black, those were entirely different data sources. Um, they are not mechanically linked together in any way. So now I'm going to show you a scatter plot of these. So I'm going to put, I'm going to look at the change in the after-tax share for each of the ten groups. If their, if their marginal tax rate didn't change, they'd be at zero. You can see by my axes, there's going to be no zeros here. Uh, they would be at zero. And then I'm going to look at the hours change on the vertical axis. And I'll start with a couple of the married groups for the married groups. The labels here are an indicator of their skill. I, how many, if they work full time, how much would they earn for, in a month? So 2110 is $2,110 a month earnings uh, potential. And these four groups are all pretty close together. First of all, in the vertical dimension. They all had their hours per week fall quite a bit, um, but similar to each other. It's kind of interesting. The other thing they're all similar on is their marginal tax rates fell uh, about the same amount, 11 or 12 uh, log points. Now there's a fifth, I said I did five skill groups. There's a fifth skill group. It's not the investment advisors, or I don't know, maybe these days investment advisors do only make 4,700 a month, I don't know. Um, but this is the highest school group I look at, an average income of 4,700 uh, a month when they work full time. And their hours fell less, and guess what, their marginal tax rate fell less. Now I'm going to show you the, the unmarried people, the black ones are the married people. Um, here's the unmarried people. The unmarried people are very different, except for the bottom two groups, are very different from each other by skill on their marginal tax rate changes. Some had huge hits in their marginal tax rates. Others had lesser. The reason for the huge hits, like the food stamps. Food stamps is a big deal for these guys, not for those guys. Um, and then you can see vertically in their hours, guess what, this is the groups whose hours fell the most. It's the groups hours that fell the, th you know, the third most. Casey, why, does, why is the food, the two groups on 2110, why is the uh, after tax share so different? You mentioned food stamps. What, what is it in the tax system and benefit system? Well, they're, they're the same on unemployment insurance. They don't check your marital status. But every other anti poverty program, they look at your household income. And if you got a spouse, so you assume something if you're married about, which is fine, but you assume something about the spouse's income. I assume that, that the spouse puts your family over to poverty level by themselves, which basically means they earn a little bit more than minimum wage. Uh, ten. Notice the ticks here. This is two points. This is like one of these alone would be like a recession. So these are not trivial differences among these groups. Same on this axis. These are not trivial differences among the groups. Um, and for some 
reason, single people take a lot longer to get back to work. Um, and my, I think something that's a good reason for that is the programs for them expanded a lot more. Yeah. Let me just suggest a different interpretation than the one I think you're suggesting, which is the adjustments to the tax and benefit, mostly benefit system, and the aftermath of the financial crisis uh, was designed to compensate more the people who lost more in terms of labor market earnings potential. And so instead of interpreting this as reflecting the, the power of incentives, it's just the political system's response to who got hit worst by the uh, recession and its aftermath. Well, mo most of the law changes happen at or when this, these were falling. But the, I would point to the difference between single and married. When they pass these laws, do they know that the single people were going to have such a different experience? I understand skills are variable. That's a good point. OK, so that, that, that goes a long ways to them. I think overturn this other, argue against this other interpretation. I like comparing like these two. It's like they're married. They got a ring on their finger. And I'm not saying their skills identical. They're being married as a select group. Draw your conclusion about the size of the work incentive effects on the, by isolating the marital status variation. Well, I, I, that's why I did colors here so you can see that. No, I, I, I appreciate but it's also, but there's an interaction. The skill, the skill and the marriage interact. That's why I started with this. It's like there's no skill gradient among the married people. There is a skill gradient among the unmarried people. You know, what's up with that? I've heard people saying that, oh, in prior recessions, the, skilled people, the unskilled people get hammered. OK, but not if you're, an un, uh, you're a married skilled person in this recession. See, so you're, you're telling me the slope. I just, I'm just trying to, I just do the eyeball comparison across, within a skilled group, but across marital status, I get a similar slope yeah. to the overall. Well, that's, that's the point you're making. OK, I get it. And also just a lack of variability among the married people by skill. Yeah, but that's consistent with the other interpretation, too, because there's, there's not much variability in how much they, their work hours change. And I don't see that as refuting the other interpretation. They got similar size shocks, and they got similar size responses by the well, Why should this guy's demand shock be more similar to this guy's than to this guy's? If I look at the industries they work at and things like that, they would tend to work at these type of industries. Yeah. Whereas these other two guys are more similar in both their variables. They had similar demand shocks and similar marginal tax rate shots and similar outcomes. I think the interaction is worth, worth looking at as well. Yeah. You assume that employers treat married and unmarried people like that. Either that or I should open a business renting wedding rings to people going on job interviews. Um, that's, it's got to be one or the other. Or maybe if they know that you're married and you have a family to provide for, it'll be less likely. That's why I said I should have a business renting a wedding ring and say, look, you want to get the job? Well, that's just going, that's going just to rent a ring. A job as opposed to already being in a job. Is this all men or women? These are men and women together. I have a, a chart in my book that looks at just the women. This is a stronger pattern for women than both of the marginal tax rate changes, because men don't get into the food stamp program and stuff as much, because they tend not to have the kids and those sort of issues. Um, OK, so I, to, to conclude, I think uncertainty or fear, if you want to call it that, risk aversion, they affect the demand for social insurance. And they affect the optimal de demand. And I think in any kind of reasonable political system, they would affect the, op the actual social insurance. Um, and unless there's some kind of free lunch that we can increase social insurance without affecting behavior, then I'm going to conclude that more social insurance depresses the labor market. Uh, social insurance creeps, creates a labor wedge, especially on the employer side. In that sense, since today's December 7th, I'll quote FDR, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear creates social insurance, and that creates a, a depression. 
Second point is uncertainty could affect the quantity of labor, even the quantity of investment, um, more through social insurance than through other mechanisms. And I kind of just throw that in two different ways, one with the labor wedges um, and the other with, with kind of the back of the envelope calculations on uh, uh, through investment. Now, I didn't emphasize investment a lot. The paper's about the labor market. But of course, if we're going to have less labor, there's, why build cubicles for them to, people not to work in and why build machines for people not to work with? So the desired capital stock depends on the amount of labor. And pretty small change in the desired capital stock could depress investment quite a bit. So you already knew this. It's, more social insurance is going to depress investment and not just labor. I've emphasized the labor part, but it's not a surprise to me that investment has been low. And the third point is whether you disagree with all the stuff on top, the degree of social insurance changed. There's more of it now. Um, and that's, uh, it's a big change, number one. We haven't seen these kind of changes too recently. And it's enough to depress the labor market, I think, at least 5%. It's enough to depress investment at least 10%. So it's a pretty big factor in what's been happening. Yeah. Count things in terms of uncertainty in social insurance, but how do you disentangle that from inequality and in redistribution? So I, I just can I, one, let me give a little backdrop to the question. There are long, we have compelling evidence that there are long term increases in inequality. Okay, go back at least a couple of decades. I think, I'm not, let me just assert without getting into a long discussion that up to the, um, up to the financial crisis, the trends on variability of earnings, uh, risk of job loss, and so on were in the opposite direction. Okay, so well, that may, may have shifted a lot, but. But how should I think about it? And let's get back to the question earlier about dynamic formulation of this, in which you have to start thinking about the, the, district, uh, the distinction between redistribution and uh, insurance. So kind of a vague question. Can you help me think more clearly about that? Well, I, I guess I was thinking along the same lines you were, that we've had trends in inequality before that maybe not were, were not accompanied by changes in uncertainty. And, you know, did the social degree in social insurance expand over that time? Not so much. I mean, that's kind of this political economy literature that's been so disappointed with itself that it, we've seen all this inequality, and where's the social insurance that's supposed to go with it? Um, but we got it in the last five years. Sorry, no. I'm just like a simple point. I mean, if, if, if the inequality is going up because it's basically it's the return to skill that is increasing, then I mean, <coughs> this is not an argument for for higher social insurance. And, but it, but no, it, well, it is. A, I agree on your first point. And the second point, there's been hundreds of median voter models out there. Thinking about, OK, if you take the view of a voter with a social welfare fund, utilitarian social welfare yeah. fund, sure. OK, fine. But I mean, it's, it's an increase in inequality. It's an increase in wage dispersion is sort of, uh, you can think of it as efficient in some ways. Yeah. It's just, I the agree return to skill is going up. You know, people are acquiring more education, and, uh, and overall, this translates into an increase in productivity. Uh, so, so okay. E even if you take the view of a, a utilitarian government, uh, which would increase the distribution, the distribution would not increase that much because by increasing the distribution, you are also uh, reducing the incentives for skill accumulation. So there's a which lead to increased productivity. So there's a strong counter argument mm -hmm. for, uh, so all I'm saying is that if, if what we have seen in the last 30 years is mostly an increase returns to skill, then there's not such a strong force towards uh, uh, increasing the distribution. Yeah, I agree with you. So that, that could be like a, yeah, yeah. okay. That's all. Good, all right, thank you. Okay, can I just make one, yeah. one quick point? I mean, I think the, you know, the, uh, I sort of appreciate the argument and the, um, and the point that you're making, I guess one um, uh, counter argument to uh, the, what you're saying is that it's a point that has been made by Asimoglu and Scheimer and uh, uh, Zilli Botti and Marimon in a couple of papers uh, a few years ago, 
that um, if you uh, if you increase unemployment insurance, the duration or the generosity, then essentially what you're doing is you're increasing unemployment duration, but you're giving more time for workers to find the right match. Uh, if you think of an economy with heterogeneous skills and heterogeneous, yeah, but that, but that. no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that you know it's a trade-off. I mean, you could you. No, you're doing there's, there's a very strong assumption built in to even get to the trade-off, which is no job search. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay, Maybe yes. you're better off finding yeah. the right match while you're already working. Right, right. No, no. That, that's no, this is you're absolutely right about that. But there are there are certain jobs where you know on-the-job search is not that, that easy. Well, I mean, not only that. You think about like low-skill jobs, you don't have all that, that time to. The UI agency never checks whether you're searching either. So, I don't know how a program that never enforces that rule would encourage you to do that behavior that they don't check on. No, but I understand, but uh, it sort of reduces the urgence to find a job. So it gives you more time to find the right match. But I, I, I think Steve's point is very well taken. It's a criticism to the whole argument. Yeah. Good, thank you.